Awesome. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody that's here. We've got, uh, uh, I think, uh, as many people who are not part of the commission as are. So great to see John Sand again. And Celia, thanks for joining us again. Really appreciate it. Good to see Jennifer and Frank and everybody. Um, my name's Doug Shipman. I'm the chair. I, I know it says co-chair, but I don't have a co-chair with me. So I guess that makes me the chair because uh, nobody else seems to take the other meetings. <laughs> Anybody who wants to step up is welcome. Um, so we do have a quorum and we also had a volunteer to take minutes, but I don't think that volunteer to take minutes is with us yet. Not yet. Oh, um, but we are, we're going to roll along um, and hopefully they can catch up. So um, I was going to welcome Laura Bloomquist uh, uh, as our new there member of the commission. And there she is. hey, there she is. All right. Oh, where'd she go? There she is. Hey, Laura. Welcome. Great to see you. And uh, what I like to do is I'll call it lightning introductions because uh, we have a fairly full agenda and a couple of members of the public to say some things as well. Perfect. Uh, and unlike town council meetings, we do not have a three minute limit. So that's kind of nice, huh? Right. Um, so why don't we, uh, Laura, if you'd like to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your service background uh, or your connection to the service. And then we're gonna go very quickly around everybody else. So you have the benefit of knowing who else is on the team here. Great, thanks. Um, I'm a retired teacher, just retired this year, 30 years in public school. I was in Hartford and Manchester. My dad was in the Navy. His brother was in the Navy. My brother-in-law is in the Air Force. My grandfather was in the Army. So um, veterans are very close to my heart. And when I saw this opening, um, I, I was working at Town Hall. I was really anxious to try to be a part of it because they are very special people. Awesome, thank you. We're glad you did. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're just going to go around in the order that I can see people and, uh, and let guests introduce themselves during the public comment period. So we'll just go through the commissioners. I see Frank Senna next. Okay, Frank Senna or Senna, doesn't bother me. Retired right. uh, U.S. Uh, Army Reserve Chief Warrant Officer 4, uh, Vast Active Mission uh, Operation Joint Endeavor Bosnia before I decided that I was Hold it up, stop to do that stuff. Wow. Awesome. Jennifer? Uh, Jennifer Black, uh, retired nurse social worker. Um, I was an army nurse in Vietnam, uh, 1970 to 71. So that's my claim to fame. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself, even though we can't see your face? Yeah, you know what, Doug? I got to break down and get a new computer that actually has a camera. I know, so I seem like I'm hiding. Uh, hey, Laura, welcome to the uh, to the committee. Uh, the committee, and uh, my name is Mark Rudowitz. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I was a combat engineer in uh, canine. I got to work with the canines as a handler, and then from there went on to Hartford Police, retired, and I worked for another police department. But uh, I, welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Awesome. Rick Newell, would you like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hello? There you we go, got Rick. you. Go ahead. Hello? Hi, Rick. Hi. Hi, Rick. We hear you. Uh, my name's Rick Newell. I'm a retired Marine. I served in Vietnam. I work for the Disabled American Veterans. And, uh, happy to have you aboard. Thank you. Awesome. Um, my name is Doug Shipman. I'm a retired Army officer, uh, 30 years of active and reserve duty. Um, my, my tours, fortunately, in Iraq and Saudi Arabia did not result in a Purple Heart, and I'm very pleased to say that, <laughs> unlike uh, Rick and, and some others. So um, we are fortunate to be supported by two awesome town staff members, and uh, Mary and Chris. Uh, Mary first, maybe, and then Chris, you want to introduce yourselves? Mary Tebow, I'm the Assistant Director of the Parks and Recreation Department for the Town of Weathersfield. And this is a cool group, so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And Chris? Um, I'm, hi, hi, I'm Chris Taylor. I'm the Elderly Services Coordinator for the Town 
through social and youth services and veteran services contact person. And I welcome you, Laura, and we have a lot of fun on this committee. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, Mary and Chris are very um, modest about their many uh, contributions to the veterans effort, as you probably guessed, but Mary handles all of the Memorial Day parade activities and veterans uh, affairs and now our newsletter. Uh, and, wow. and Chris probably knows half the veterans in Weathersfield, uh, and they know her as a source of great support. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have them working every day on behalf of the citizens of Weathersfield. Um, another quick thing, you know, I know we're all appointed through political parties, but one of the things that we all maintain here is there are no politics on this commission. We're here to support veterans, doesn't matter who they are, what, what you know, brand of politics they believe in, if they serve the country, they deserve our support. Um, so I'd like to very quickly uh, go over to public comments, and uh, we have three members of the public with us, and if each of you would just very quickly introduce yourself and then we'll go back to you uh, and ask you to share your comments that you came to just talk about. So uh, I'll start with you, Celia, if you just wanna introduce yourself and then we'll move along. Um, sure, I'm glad to. Uh, Celia Allison, I, I work for the town actually. I work for the library, I'm a librarian there. And um, I have personal um, love for veterans as my son is one. Uh, but uh, I'm really just an interested party. I'm not here officially to represent the library, but uh, we are interested as a library, as, as a department of the town, we are very, very interested in what goes on with the town veterans. And if there's any little way that we can support them, um, Doug will let us know down the road. We've done one or two things in the past and um, going this pandemic from a monkey wrench and everything, but we look forward to doing more in the future. Hey, great to have you here. Uh, Andrea, would you like to just introduce yourself and your connection to the military? And then we'll come back to you in a minute for a longer uh, opportunity to speak. Sure. Um, my name is Andrea Mears. I am a Weathersfield resident and um, wife of a Army National Guard soldier. Um, I am just looking to hopefully create a group in town to support our military family. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And last but not least, John Sand. Doug. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a social studies teacher here at Weathersfield High School for the last 20 plus years. And uh, I've worked with the committee before, really since its founding. Uh, I started with uh, the committee to uh, help run our DJ celebration a few years back. And uh, I am sitting in my car in Boston watching my son play baseball. So huh? forgive my surroundings here. <laughs> Uh, great to have all of you. So why don't we, um, we'll just follow the order of the agenda and, and that might work out in John's interest Then he can go back to his baseball game. Uh, we'll start with John. I know you had some things you wanted to share about teaching history in Weathersfield. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I, I had written uh, written to you as a committee just um, really almost out of frustration. Uh, several years ago, the state um, passed the new social studies and re English requirements, and uh, they no longer require U.S. history to be taught at the high school level, uh, in addition to world history or international studies or anything else other than civics. Um, districts, I think, across the state have adopted their own uh, requirements that require kids from X high school to take U.S. history to graduate, but Weatherfield High School has no such requirement, meaning starting this year with the sophomore class, uh, you can have kids go through high school with no U.S. history um, and no international studies or world history and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, I simply don't know what else to do, Doug. I, I've tried to get this change from the inside for the past two years because I knew it was coming. Uh, I'm formerly the department liaison for social studies at the high school. Uh, I resigned my position in protest um, because I think this is just devastating. And when I think of the people that served this country and did what they did to, so that we could all have our freedom to, to have kids go through high school and not learn about that. Just, I, I don't know. I can't use the words to tell you how I really feel. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that if the committee is in agreement with that, uh, that they can take the ball and run with it because uh, I have failed. And uh, it's, I just think it's tragic that, that kids can go through without learning the history of their country. 
John, thank you. And can you just to clarify, because I did uh, a little bit of background myself just to kind of prepare for this issue. And according, you know, what's on the town's website says the classes of 2021 and 2022 have to take a one credit class in American history. Are you saying that is not the case any longer? Right. So this year's uh, sophomore class, um, the, the state changed the requirements and it, it affects this year's sophomore so that they are only required to take eight credits in humanities and a half a credit in civics. Um, so the, the high school requirements don't add anything to that. Um, if you look, they typically have course catalogs for different years of, of classes so that this year's graduating class, it says you need a credit in U.S. history, you need a credit mm -hmm. in this, that kind of stuff. But to your sophomore's okay. class, that's no longer the case. And, you know, for, for a kid, that means they could take four years of art, four years of band, civics, and they're, and they're good to go. Right. And so it, it sounds like it's really a, a town issue, right? Because the the state's approach was designed specifically to relinquish control to the municipalities, which the municipalities had asked for for many years. Uh, and so the reason the state does not require it is they're, they're trying to heed the desire of town boards of education that want to set their own standards. Weathersfield now, having been given that prerogative, is now discontinuing American history. Is that what's happened? They're discontinuing it as a, as a required course. So the course yeah. will still be offered. We'll have it there. And, you know, right. honestly, uh, Doug, most kids will take it. Um, my fear is that kids who might need it the most will be the ones that don't take it. Um, and it, it's one of those things. And, it, and it's the same with international studies. I mean, the concept of kids graduating high school without having learned about the Holocaust, for instance, I, I, right. it, it just stun, it stuns me. Um, clearly what I think most districts have done is said, that's fine, that's what the state requires. And we as you know, District X also require in addition to that or as part of that uh, US history. When I, when I talked to a colleague of mine who's department head at another district, he was stunned um, mm -hmm. that we, we didn't kind of step into that void and say, okay, this is what we're specifically going to do. Um, and it's something that I have brought up for the last two years. And it has and just been, we're not doing that. Uh, Interesting. I, I, yeah, I'm absolutely flummoxed. Uh, are there other commission members that would like to ask questions? Go ahead, Jennifer? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, I mean, if, when, uh, if you've been um, discussing this with, the, um, with school officials and, and do they offer any kind of rationale, any kind of reasoning behind their decision? Their feeling is, is that most kids would take it anyway. Um, and, and, and that is true. Most kids will take it anyway. Um, but again, it's, it's, to me, it's too, too valuable, too important to, to leave right. it up to student choice on that. Right. No, I agree with you. I, I don't understand how, how, how they could take civics without having some history behind the development of civics. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. There's a, lot, there's a lot of history that goes into, into civics. <laughs> Very disappointing. Uh, John, do you have a, 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 a series of perhaps guest lecturers who might want to come in and talk about something? It's not necessarily military oriented, but uh, I was an MI officer, so I have a lot of background in terms of certain conflicts and why they happen, the politics or the religion of it. Uh, is there anything like that? I've spoken at my, my grandson's grammar school. <laughs> yes, Frank, it's uh, all that stuff is very informal. There's not a formal program for that. Uh, obviously, with COVID, nobody comes into the building anymore at all. Um, but I've had various guests in over the over the time simply to share knowledge and, and information that's, you know, either firsthand or if you're an expert in something in which I am not. Um, but there's nothing uh, formal set up like that. Any other questions about John's specific issue from the members of the commission? What would you like to see us do, John, uh, as a commission? How can we help you? Well, I think if the if the commission is in favor of that, um, I don't know if a, if a letter to the board of ed 
stating you would support a U.S. history requirement and, uh, and you know, whatever else you think you would support. Um, I'm not sure. I, I certainly don't want um, to the, the commission to be acting on my behalf. I just thought that this is something that I know is near and dear to the hearts of the people that I worked with on the commission previously and that they would want to know about it. Um, so what what anybody does with it, I, you know, I, I kind of leave that up to the commission. I, I also have a question just what who have you already addressed this to just so we know you know like don't don't go to the same people again or, or whatever if if anything is done sure well uh, on the inside it, it everything has to go through sally desk um she is the uh, assistant superintendent who's pretty much in charge of everything um it, she has not been willing to consider this hmm. okay hmm. And, and then you said that the uh, the the, uh, the commission assumed that a number of students would actually want to take the course. Do you actually have numbers in terms of how many by grade actually do participate in a in a, in a American history course? So historically, every every student has had to take it. Um, so that's always been if there's 300 kids in a class, 300 kids would take it. I don't know if there's any estimates as what's going to happen in the future as to how many kids will or how many kids won't. Um, so I, I'm not sure what they're anticipating. Um, and certainly the, the director of guidance, uh, Ms. Bryan, has been um, basically stating the same thing, that she's certain that most kids will take it but no one can, no one will know until they sign up. And when is that? The next semester? Are they, are they, this, September? This, September? It'll be for September. Kids are signing up now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Mark, did you have a question? I, I see your box lighting up, so I wasn't sure. No, no, but you know what? Uh, I'll do what I can to, to help any way, uh, John, to make that a requirement. I think that's vitally important uh, yeah. for, for kids to uh, to be required to, to know our history and our American history. Yeah, I, well, I appreciate that. And I, I can't think of another state or another country, any country really, that would allow its students to go through their educational system without learning their history. It just boggles my mind. Right, right. absolutely. So here's a question. Um, so the course curriculum comes out presumably now for students to sign up in fall. Right? Yes. So after I retired as an intelligence officer, I went into the civilian world as a marketing vice president because in marketing you do intelligence, you do it on consumer groups, right? And so, have you thought about is there a way to promote that course amongst the students? So a little marketing campaign, if you will. To promote it, uh, get enthusiasm about it yourself. Sure. I mean, uh, the you know the sophomore teachers uh, right now, U.S. history is offered to juniors, uh, and the sophomore teachers will all across the board recommend to their kids, uh, their students that they sign up for U.S. history. That that'll be a given. They'll say, "Listen, I think you should take U.S. history because it's important." That kind of thing. Um, it's just no. I think there's two things. One, there's no guarantee that, that who will or won't take it. And the second thing I think, Frank, is that it, it, it sends a signal to what we think is important, where we say you have to do this and you have to do that, but you don't have to do U.S. history. So I think it's, it's you know, and that's more of a philosophical uh, yeah. stance that, that, you know, I, again, I struggle with. Well, can you put some meat around that, you know, it's a good thing to do? Can you put some some uh, some uh, examples as to why it's important to learn U.S. history to to self promote it, if you will, amongst the students. Uh, the other other teachers are promoting other programs, but is there, is there a way for you or others or the, the, the sophomore uh, teachers to really put some meat on the bones in terms of why it's important? Sure. I think, uh, first of all, I think teachers will do that anyway um, and, and talk about that. I, th I think you have some uh, popular teachers that teach it. So I think that's another selling point. Um, and the third selling point is that, listen, if, you, if you're going to go to a, to a high end college, they're going to want to have it. They're going to want to yeah. see that you took that course. So yeah. there are things in favor of that. Um, but like I said earlier, I'm, I'm afraid that some of the kids that, that really need it the most are going to be the ones who aren't going to take it. Um, and, and that's something I think is, you know, if this is the end of a, a student's education in high school, 
then they literally will will never have had U.S. history, um, and, and and that's the uh, that's dangerous to me. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, do parents of the students have an opportunity to influence their their student children in terms of you know I was I was I was in the military. Uh, your grandfather was in the military. Uh, your your uncle was a historian. Is there a way for parents to get involved to encourage their student children to take uh, American history? I think so. I, I would be surprised, Frank, if, if parents knew right now that kids could opt out of it. I, I don't think that they're they're aware. Um, certainly, well, I think Doug, I think I caught the commission by surprise in, in sharing this, and I think uh, most people would be shocked to, to hear that. And I yes. think including parents. Um, so I. I I'm not, I, I don't think the parents would even know that that was an option right now. Um, but it, it will become knowledge. It will, it will, you know, be out there. Parents will know that? I think they will pretty soon. I mean, if a kid's not doing well in a class, um, if he's not doing well in U.S. history, he can say, hey, I'm just not going to take it. I'll drop it. Yeah, but um, like, how are they getting it? Okay. Right, that's, a, that's a passive approach that the, the curriculum for the fall comes out and is it sent to the parents or is it sent to is it just the student who makes that call? Uh, usually both. Uh-huh. So it seems to me that the message would be uh, yeah, uh, is a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, a way to reinforce it uh, for the force, force multiplier in the military to get the parents really on board I mean, because they're going to have influence uh, and the kid may not understand, but from your parent, uh, it's, just, it's a force multiplier. We, we, you can get the message out by really getting to the parents. I just don't know how you really get to the parents. You know, there's no guarantee that they're going to even know. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's a, it's a way of promoting it to the parents. I just don't know how to do that in, in your environment. So I, I, I don't think I they're think aware we're, uh, of their own requirements. Um, yeah. I think that they would very quickly re reinstate it, put it back in, and say it is a requirement. That would that would be my guess. That would be my hope. Right, folks. I think we're going to need to leave this off here, um, just out of interest of covering everything on our agenda in in the hour and, and giving some of the other members of the public that came a chance to speak. But John, we will talk about this and, yeah. and see if there's a an angle where the commission feels it can be helpful. Um, if you are working with other groups uh, about this as well, that uh, you know we might be a voice among many uh, that would create some kind of synergy, that might be a helpful angle as well. So let us know as you continue talking about this with other groups as well, um, so we can you know coordinate any efforts. Um, that need to be coordinated uh, in order to, you know, help move this a little bit. Great, Doug. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. If, it, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn off and go back to the game. But I, uh, I really appreciate you hearing me out, and uh, hopefully, we can move forward and do what's best for the kids. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye -bye. So, let's move to Andrea now, who came in to talk with us about her experiences and a proposal. So Andrea, we'll turn it over to you. All right. So as I stated, my name is Andrea. Uh, one, one, one quick thing, Andrea. Somebody has some really loud background noise, and I don't know who it is, but I'll, I'll just ask everybody to please mute yourselves if you are not speaking. Um, I have a suspicion, Chris, that it's coming from your phone. But uh, if, if you all could make an effort to minimize the background noise in your area, that would be really helpful so we can hear Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Andrea Spears and I'm a military spouse. Uh, my husband is Alex, um, who was a sergeant in the Connecticut Army National Guard and has so far served for eight years. Um, up until a year ago, I treated his devotion and participation as a soldier as just a second job that all changed once he deployed I quickly realized um, this was now my life as well on September 5th 2019 reality set in very fast when I waved him off at the airfield and knew I wouldn't be seeing him again um, till about a year later I remembered that day like it was yesterday um, starting the car was very difficult because I knew I'd be leaving alone that day 
um, days and weeks passed where I didn't say more than a few words to family or anyone for that matter. No one knew how lonely it was and how I was feeling inside. I soon realized though that it was something I couldn't navigate on my own and instead needed support from others who understood. It was a Saturday and I was desperate. So I called military one source and was immediately asked my name, um, my husband's name, his pay grade, and if I had any intentions of hurting myself. My first reaction was to say, I'm sorry, did I call the right number? I'm just looking for a referral to a therapist or a military spouse to talk to. She continued with yes, but before I can look into that for you, let me remind you that it is the weekend, so it's harder to reach people and I still need your husband's information first. I was so confused, I was so confused and upset that I needed to answer a million questions to get help that I actually hung up. Um, and then I later thought maybe I wasn't in the right frame of mind in terms of being patient, but I was vulnerable and emotional and I felt like I was talking to someone who was just reading from a script. Needless to say, that was my first and last interaction with military one source. Um, however, thankfully I was able to connect with the military spouse after contacting the family readiness person I met through the yellow ribbon ceremony. This spouse had her own group in East Granby twice a month, and there I was able to connect with other spouses and even met a, um, another wife whose husband was currently deployed with Alex as well. I can't begin to express what a relief this was. We all took care of each other. We checked in on one another, met up for walks and coffee from time to time, and spent hours on the phone just sobbing or opening up about our day or, or that week. This group did wonders for all of us, but most importantly, our husbands knew we were we had a support system and an outlet that could help us navigate through this journey. Starting a group in town will not only help military families, but also educate the community so that we can all support one another, no matter the title of military or civilian. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. I muted myself, so I was following my own instructions and then I forgot that I had done that, but thank you. And <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to prepare comments about your experience. And uh, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of us, I know I have deployed and left family members behind and it's, it's extremely hard on the family members that are behind, whether they're male or female, uh, married or unmarried, and, and it, it's really hard. So um, are you thinking that you would start a group in, in Wethersfield? Is that your proposal? That are yes. you interested in leading that group? Yes, I would I would love to do that, especially with um, the group that I attended in the past when he was gone and seeing kind of how we ran that group and how it was able to help not just the wives, but the husbands, the extended families, the children. So I would love to do that in town and help mm -hmm. help out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like you were kind of referred to the folks in East Granby through the Yellow Ribbon program, is that right? Um, it was a contact I made. Um, her name was also Kim. She was kind of the one who was hosting the Yellow Ribbon ceremony, and she seemed oh. like she pretty much ran family readiness, um, and she knew the ins and outs, and she said, hey, contact this person that I know. She she gave me her contact and said, if I come across any families or wives or husbands or whoever that wants to chat, that she's on, she's on call 24 seven. So just here's her number and call her. And I, I was like, okay. So I called and sure enough, 7 PM at night, she answered the phone with three screaming kids in the background. And we stayed on the phone for about two to three hours. And I just sobbed and she walked me through it and invited me to her group. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah, I, I, I know other members of the commission may have questions, so I should stop asking you questions because I'll ask you lots of questions. Um, <laughs> but uh, go ahead, if anybody else has a question or, or thought for Andrea. Are you still attending this group, Andrea? Are you, no, okay. We, I mean, they were meeting in person pre-COVID? Uh, yes, we met in person up until COVID hit and then we started doing it through Zoom. Yeah. But I actually don't have that group anymore because it was the summer before he returned home um, that spouse no longer ran the group. Her husband was suffering from severe um, PTSD and they were having their own um, issues within their marriage. So they're no longer married. And so she figured, how can I be the face of this group and talk about these things 
with my journey with him if we're no longer married. So, so now there's no group. <laughs> it no longer exists. The group no longer exists. Right. It's, it's, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it's certainly a worthy um, issue to take up. Uh, it's just, I mean, this would be a newsletter <laughs> uh, item possibly, or, um, you know, some way to, I mean, I don't know how many other women or other spouses would be interested. Do you have any idea of how many other spouses in town might be interested? Have you checked that out? Well, I was thinking since Weathersfield's so close to, you know, Hartford, Middletown, Rocky Hill, it's, it neighbors a lot of towns, especially a lot of big towns that have a lot of um, wives right now whose husbands just recently deployed. Since we're kind of like a little central hub, I was like, even if we, even if it brought in families or wives or husbands or, or from wherever in yeah. the state to Weathersfield to join our group, it would still yeah. be the same because we had, so in the group that I was in, we had a wife who her husband was in the Navy and he had just deployed and it was no, they pretty much, they had no contact really. She wasn't going to talk to him for eight months. Um, and so she wasn't from the same town. I came, I went to East Granby from Weathersfield. Another spouse was there from Enfield. Um, there was two females from Massachusetts. So we were kind of just from all over the place. Yeah, okay. Is, uh, Andre, is your husband still in the military? He is, he, he yeah. wants to do 20 years. <laughs> oh, good for him, all right. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> is there a chance that he will deploy again, do you think? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that I mean that that gives you, I think, a really important long-term stake in this issue, particularly yeah. if, if he thinks. Does he feel like he'll stay in his current role, or or at least at the the is he at the Hartford Armory right now? Um, no, he right now is with TASM and uh, Groton. Oh, that's, that's he right. was at the Hartford Armory, and that's that was our that was what I called the safe ground because those people don't deploy. So I was like, stay in there. Don't leave that unit. Cause then I know you're never going to deploy, but he's like, yeah. well, I need to get a deployment under my belt. So he went, <laughs> Yeah, he deployed with aviation. And, uh, but you're likely to stay in Connecticut. Is that your yes. intent? Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Any other questions for Andrea? Yeah, Celia, go Andrea. ahead. This is this is Rick Knoll, if you can hear me. Uh, yeah. I realize you want to start this group, but my suggestion for you might be to go to the Outreach Center in uh, Rocky Hill, which is on the corner of West Street, and maybe explain to some of the counselors there your plans, and they might be able to uh, make a room uh, affordable to you for your meetings. It's the, uh, it's the Vet Center on, in Rocky Hill. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was going to Yes. And and also, if not, then maybe you could even try uh, the Rocky Hill Veterans Home because I know that the veterans groups do meet there. Okay, so they meet at they meet at their at the VA there. Yeah, there there have been veterans groups that have held meetings there, uh, and I'm sure if you talk to somebody there, I, you'd have to talk to uh, Tom uh, Sars who's the commissioner, or uh, you can get it, get in contact with, uh, I just do a blank, but Helen would know the persons uh, to talk to up there, Helen and I. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tammy Marsnick is one of the people. She's a specialist projects coordinator. Okay. So from my personal experience with this, um, Going to, so the group was very close to the um, airport where, and, and with the, the unit's home station, um, right. this group that I went to in East Granby. So what that did for me every day or a couple times a month when I drove there was it brought me back to that. I had just dropped him off there. That's where I left him. And, and to me, that was kind of like reliving the reliving that bad day over and over because I kept driving by it 
Um, same right. thing with looking with with even driving by a VA, driving by his job, driving by anything that was military related just brought me right back to that day. Um, and so the fact that this group was in a little historical home in East Granby and it had nothing military related inside and it was a very um, just nice, quiet, organic place where everyone can just get together and vent and everyone that was there was living through it or had lived through it made a big difference. Um, and I think that with going to the, maybe going to the VA, it might be more of um, where people might look at it like it's a mental health kind of thing that we're running a group in there. And it's not, it's more for us to build this community where everyone can support each other, not just during the deployment, but for life, you can make a lifetime friend and you can have that person to turn to and not necessarily feel like, well, once they're back from this deployment, like, bye, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> I made a lot of friends for my group and we still check on each other now, especially with going through the reintegration process. Now um, we give each other tips and tell each other what works or places we went to that people were friendly and accepting or people weren't. So it's kind of, it's what I was looking to do was kind of just have a little space in town where people can get together and it could be fun. It's not supposed to be depressing. It's we, a lot of the times in our group, we did things like we would have group walks, pizza night. Um, we would have times when we would decorate um, boxes for the soldiers and we'd send them off. Um, we'd collect cards from elementary schools, um, letters written to soldiers, just to kind of be a little uplifting for them there. We would do yoga, Reiki, like spiritual healing stuff, um, movie night. We did a lot of things like that just to, to build the bond. It wasn't, it wasn't really that we were all looking for an answer because there is no answer. You're not going to feel whole again until that person comes home. It was more to just be able to get through it. Um, I want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask you questions, Andrea, too. Celia, did you have a, a question or were you going to offer library space for this? Uh... As another member of the public, um, Andrea, I, I, would, I would have died to have a group like you're talking about. I would have given my eye teeth when my son was away for a year. Yeah. And eight. We were very close. We are very close. I missed him like I, I, I couldn't stand it. And I had no one to talk to about it because my husband just is so matter of fact. And I did try, I was told to, oh, call. He was stationed out of Fort Dix. He was out of, he's down in Philadelphia. And I called, they said, oh, call Fort Dix and talk, see if you can find the family support people. Well, I tried and I got lost in some a, a maze I could not get out of. And nobody there knew what I was asking for. And they were all very matter of fact. And I was looking for, warm cuddly, some somebody that I felt safe to cry in front of. And yeah. that was not the place for me to get that. Um, but I, I think this is invaluable, what you were talking about, and not just for spouses, but for extended family, for moms who are missing their little boys or their little girls, um, it, especially for a first appointment. It's very, very difficult. Um, yeah. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of um, informal or nonprofit groups that cater to both veterans who are no longer in the service, but I think also to people that are engaged in the military in different ways, too. And, and we haven't started to become a, a, a contact point for a lot of those organizations, but um, I think that's something it's that kind of a thing we could probably help do is serve as a conduit for information to help connect people. Because we, uh, as a commission ourselves, we don't provide a lot of services per se. Our real role is to help people connect, provide information and, and draw attention to problems or issues. I'm wondering, uh, Chris, if you're um, able to say anything about do you get many um, spouses or active duty service members contacting you uh, at the town hall for support in any way? Hi, Doug. Um, not too many. I, I mean, we get, we do get um, members of the military that call us when they have problems like with financial or they need food uh, or housing. 
Um, but I, I really haven't had um, anyone, to be honest with you, call for a family support group. Hmm. I think this is, you know, first time that I'm hearing it. But I think it is a very good idea. And um, I wondered if the, you know, Cecilia, if you know if the library community room is, is available for this kind of family support group here in town. Um, we're not open to public meetings at all at present. It's all a problem with the pandemic. We just haven't opened up that okay. far. Um, right, right. That's, that's why I wanted to ask because I wasn't sure if, if yeah. you were open or not. Yeah. We will be at some point, but not yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when, when you Thank are you. when you are open to the public, Celia, is that something the library could help with? Oh, I don't know why not. Uh, we host meetings all the time. Um, I think as as far as a venue, you mean a meeting room, a venue? Yeah. Absolutely. Once we mm -hmm. gotta get past this this virus. Um, right. Yeah, we're not even, we're only permitting one person in a study room, not even more than that. So um, I would think absolutely. And I can, since I attend these meetings on a regular basis, I'll be in a position to let you know when that happens. And I'm sure Brooke will announce it and it will be in the um, weekly management report as well. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it may not be as, as uh, you know, user-friendly a place as a private home, it sounds like, Andrea, but it, it would be a non-military place that might be uh, centrally located and accessible and has, you know, public restrooms and, you know, that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, and you could do programs there. You could bring in a yoga instructor, could come along with you and do and do yoga there as part of the, as part of your meeting, Andrea, or do crafts or, or whatever. And um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. What about the Keeney Center? Would that be uh, an option as well? Yeah, I think they usually charge, charge money. Uh, for things and, and they're still struggling to reopen as well. Uh, as we are struggling it. to reopen. We are doing some things there on a very limited basis uh, with um, COVID restrictions on the numbers. Yeah. But we do, once we get back to normal, the, there is a nonprofit group can meet uh, for free in, in the West Wing rooms. Um, so we do scout groups and all sorts of uh, community uh, garden groups and things like that. Um, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. I thought you said the Keeney Center. You you asked about the I'm community sorry. center, which is- what, Oh, that's what I said. Yeah, I said- Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, the, the Keeney Center tries to raise sorry, money that's... by renting their facility out, but the community yeah. center is a much better place. <laughs> yeah. I heard community center, but that's because I used to supervise the building. So it might just be like up here stuck. <laughs> the community center. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, would anybody like to uh, sort of work offline with Andrea to help her, you know, kind of figure out a way ahead from the commission? Hi, it's Trish. I don't mind. Oh, okay. Okay, Trish. I, I also saw Jennifer <laughs> and Chris. Were you were you chiming in too? Yeah, I I can I can help as well. Yes. So maybe that's a way to do it. And maybe if I could just ask, you know, Chris, Trish, and Jennifer to reach out to Andrea, and maybe the three of you could get together, you know, by Zoom or some other way, you know, outdoors, uh, whatever, and, and just talk about ways to help move that forward. Would that help you, Andrea? Yes. Yes, I think it's a good start. I mean, right now, I just take phone calls from the spouses who are struggling or the family members. They just kind of call to vent and just want some reassurance that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> right. Because ultimately, if you get this started, you'll want to let some of the family support centers in the area know yeah. that you have this service so that they can refer people to you then you can build a nice group. You can get other people besides yourself helping to run it. So you don't have to bear the burden yourself and, and kind of get it rolling, but uh, it may take a little help to get started. Well, I definitely think it'd be important to, for me to reach out to family readiness um, kind of around the state to let them know that this group's available so that they can mention it at their yellow ribbon ceremonies when they're preparing the families for the deployments. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you. Thanks for bringing it to us. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for others for, uh, for jumping you. in. Um, you're welcome to stay and listen to the meeting, Andrea. We're going to approve our minutes and talk about some other stuff. Uh, you're welcome to stay on or you're welcome to drop off, whichever works best for you. Um, just how are we going to get Andrea's contact information? But I will do after the meeting, I have Andrea's email address and I will send it out to uh, you, Trish, Jennifer, and Chris Taylor. Um, and then I actually, Andrea, I can do, I can include you in on it so that everybody will have everybody else's uh, email address. Awesome. That works. Okay. And then I'll kind of put that in your court and you guys can figure that out. Thank you. That's great. Great. Thanks for what you're doing, Andrea. And I appreciate your willingness to take charge of that on behalf of other spouses, because that's, that's really important. Thank you. And thank you so much for everyone in their service. No, thank you. So, Bye. Have a good so, evening. Bye, Andrea. Uh, yep. Mark, did you have a question? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, you know, I'd be glad to assist with that any way I can. Like Celia, I'm not a spouse, but I'm a father of two Marines and they've deployed both the, you know, been to Helmand province and Fallujah and all over, you know, both Iraq and Afghanistan. So, I mean, I understand how gut-wrenching it is, uh, you know, for, for a spouse, but uh, for a parent. So if anything I can assist with or share, I'd be glad to. And I had my own little network of kind of non-formal uh, folks I dealt with, you know, through benefits from Newington VA and other people I know, but uh, no, I, anything I can do to help that, uh, that, that young lady there in this group get started, I'd be glad to. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, when Mary sends her email out, she can include you on that as well, Mark, and uh, you can offer Maybe your assistance. It'll be easier now too, because we can be outdoors. And yeah. yeah. Set up yeah. activities outdoors, like you know, a good walk to, uh, around the reservoir or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, folks, we've spent uh, a good portion of our time tonight uh, on. We have 11 minutes left, or we can go a little, a little over, but we probably ought to approve the minutes. So it was time well spent, I think, and, and we don't necessarily have a lot of other things we need to discuss. But um, we have minutes from March 10th meeting, thanks to Helen. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the minutes? So moved. I'll make a motion. Jennifer, is there a second? Second, Rick Knoll. Rick, thank you very much. Any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes as stated, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Thank aye. you very much. All right. They are approved. That's a formal detail, but we do need to do that. Um, any letters and announcements? After having a very busy month last month, I did not get any, but do you have any, Chris? Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention I've been getting, as you know, I've been emailing everyone about the uh, VA walk-in COVID-19 vaccine clinics. Uh, and I just wanted to mention there's one coming up, uh, I believe that's tomorrow, April 15th. It's the Moderna, and it's at the Newington campus on 555 Willard Avenue, Building 2E in the basement. And the clinics run from 8 to 3.30. They're saying it's first come, first serve, no appointment necessary. And it's open to anyone who served in the military, spouses of veterans and caregivers of veterans. And um, so I just wanted to, to mention that because that is a last minute uh, email that went out. Great. Yeah, thank you for sending those around all that. I don't always respond to every one of them, but it's great that you're putting them out for people to share with others. I've been sharing it. I've been like posting it in the What's Going on Weathersfield um, Facebook page. It's me, Trish. Thank you. Thank, oh, that's thank great, you Trish. Thank it. you. And when I get them in the emails, I will post them on the Facebook page. So, thank you, Trish. You're welcome. Another reason we need our own Facebook page. Thank yeah. you, Trisha. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, 
this is not a letter or announcement, but I just wanted to follow up. Um, we had a very nice um, letter from a teacher, an English teacher who was uh, teaching uh, about the uh, book, the things they carried in her class. Oh, the yeah. students yeah. read it. Uh, she made a very nice offer to have her students write letters to veterans, which I think Chris Taylor is, is working with her on getting letters to some of the veterans that she serves. And then we suggested maybe Jennifer and Rick might have an opportunity to talk with her students, both as Vietnam veterans, and the book is specifically about the Vietnam experience. Would either of you like to say like what's happened with that so far? And have you talked with them yet? Or what's what's the plan? I talked to Gina the other day, and uh -huh. I'm going to be presenting the end of April, the 29th and the 30th, I think it is. And I've been, uh, I started working on it because, I mean, unlike Rick, who uh, has the, the story of what it's like to be a soldier in Vietnam, mine is so totally different. So I'm trying to think of a way to draw the students into it to um, talk about, you know, how much they know about Vietnam. They read the book, so hopefully they know where the country is. Um, but bringing up a few things, I just I just read an interesting book called The Mountain Sting by um, a woman Vietnamese writer, and it really gives um, a picture. Um, her the family in its fiction, the family in the book lives in North Vietnam, so she goes back and forth between uh, the years of the war and then after the war and how it affected all of them. It's fascinating. It's really helpful to read. Um, I mean, Viet Han Nguyen, who wrote The Sympathizer, also wrote The Committed, which is getting a lot of press right now. He's another good writer to read to get an idea of the Vietnamese perspective on all of this. So I don't know how, I don't, I don't want to, you know, bring politics into the talk, but just the reading yeah. I've been doing has expanded my understanding of uh, mm -hmm. war and its effect on the people who live there, not just Americans, but on the people who live in there. Yeah, well, I, I suggested both of you uh, to her because I feel like often people think of veterans as men and wow. they don't recognize that we have a large number of women who also serve uh, and have had, you know, uh, amazing experiences and made amazing contributions. Um, so uh, I'm glad that you're able to connect. Rick, were you able to connect with Gina? Do you have a-, a Yes, a I did. And I, I dropped off a, a packet of information from her. I, I found a uh, half a dozen Vietnam magazines. I showed her, I gave her two pictures of myself about three months before I went to Vietnam, what I looked like at 19 years old. Unfortunately, I do not look like that anymore. I look like some old rock star with gray hair, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and I also, uh, I have, uh, I, I have, I will be away the last week of uh, April, and I had told her that, but I was going to show them stuff that I have some helmets, I have some uniforms, I have gear that was worn over there, and I thought I would just show them the stuff that was carried by uh, the GIs in Vietnam. The things they yeah. care. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah, it's real eye-opening to young people to actually ha pick up a rucksack uh, with all the things that would have been in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how heavy all that stuff was, and you know. Cool. Well, that's great that you both made the connections with her. I know that she appreciates it, and it will enrich the understanding of, of the students, I think, immeasurably to talk to people that had experiences like yours. So um, very quickly running through our action items, uh, you know, commission of vacancies and appointments. This is the first meeting in our history. We haven't had to talk about that. So thank you. And thank you, Laura, for helping us fill all of our vacancies now. It's fabulous. Um, Mary circulated a nice budget summary uh, and Mary, thank you for that. Much appreciated. We don't need to discuss it. Um, implementation plan update. I think the, the main thing there was um, 
you know, congratulations to everybody that worked to get the newsletter out. And Mary, especially, thank you so much for handling all the logistics uh, and all of that with the newsletter. I think the next question was, did we need to edit a part of the newsletter to correct some of the information about the tax benefits before circulating it by email? Um, and I don't know where that is. Can anybody speak to that? I did not uh, post it. I did not email it around wondering uh, if somebody wanted to approach that. Um, it was uh, Sonia from the tax assessor's office who had brought it up. And I didn't, you know, again, if someone from the commission wanted to contact her to see if there was a way to edit that info. And again, since this will not be printed, it can go over the two pages if necessary, uh, if it takes that to clarify what she had brought up. Um, so I can put some, it's, her name is Sonia Betts, B-E-T-Z. Um, she is in the uh, tax assessor's office and um, I'm, I'm certain she would not mind working with someone to clarify that section of the newsletter. Well, I don't mind calling her because actually I've been using the benefit as a veteran for my taxes. And I want to clarify that a little bit. I think I went last year to even, I put, brought my DD 214 and said, okay, do I need to do this again? Do I, you know, and I, and I was told I was all set. So um, I don't mind calling her to clarify and, and get it all for you soon. And then Frank will talk, maybe. Do you want to just, you know? Uh, no, I really had nothing to offer other than either making, you know, helping make a decision as to how we communicate that. At. Uh, um, obviously, but I've started to thin item for the small newsletter. You're cutting up, so I'm having a hard time understanding. Yeah, Frank, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. And we have, we have one minute left, so I'm going to cut you off and just say, uh, if Mary could please send Jennifer and Frank the email that came from Sonia and that between the two of you, Jennifer and Frank, if you would please correct the information that's in the newsletter, because apparently it was not correct uh, when we sent it out by mail. So we want to get it corrected and then we can send it out by email to the people we mentioned at the previous meeting, which included town councilors, state reps, uh, all other individuals we mentioned. So we'll do that. And then we want to put it on the website, but we don't want to put it up on the website till it's corrected. So I'll leave that to the newsletter committee uh, to work on. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through the rest of the agenda. Memorial Day planning, uh, there's a meeting following this at 7.15 tonight. So I'm just going to say those interested in learning more about it, please uh, feel free to join that meeting. Um, Chris, is there anything you've spoken a little bit about things that you've been doing for town veterans? Anything you want to share that hasn't already been shared? Um, yes, I wanted to mention, can you hear me, first of all? Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you, because I've been unmuting myself and muting. So, <laughs> um, yes, I wanted to um, just to mention that I had gotten 10 calls from the regard, you know, after the newsletter went out. From new uh, and there were seven new veterans that contacted me. Uh, most of the questions were about tax relief for homeowners, but there were a couple that had asked about the House of Heroes. Uh, one gentleman, um, veteran, uh, was you know his name was not was on the list last time, but he was not one of the ones that was selected. So he was calling to find out if his house will be painted if he's on the list. So I just wanted to mention that. And then um, just, to, you know, it prompted a lot of calls from veterans out there, and I think that's a good positive thing um, about VA medical benefits, et cetera, you know. So I just wanted to share that feedback. Yeah, thank you. That is awesome. That's great. That's exactly what we're yeah. hoping will happen. And uh, hopefully we can continue to grow the uh, – the distribution list so more and more veterans we we think there are 1300 or so veterans in in Wethersfield based on on Mary's budget report it went out to just shy of a thousand addresses which is pretty darn good 
Uh, and I so only had to eight returns. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That's so, good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that's really good coverage at a very affordable cost. So well done, everybody, on that. Um, the last item is acknowledging veterans and citizens for their service. One thing we did do was um, I finally got off my butt and got the certificate formatted so we can easily put someone's name in it and present it to somebody. I think we did that initially because of the young Boy Scout who did such a nice job with the Veterans Memorial. Um, I don't know who that is, but if somebody does, I'm happy to put that person's name on it uh, and maybe it could be presented at Memorial Day uh, or something like that. So uh, just I, I defer to the Memorial Day committee uh, to say how they want to do that or if we just want to I hate to just mail them a certificate that's kind of you know anti anticlimactic but uh, Doug I, I think we should invite him I think the young man's name was John Hart I know they did a story on him on I think either in Weathersfield Life I'm not sure but I think Mary might know if I, I remember reading that in Weathersfield Life and, so and I'm blanking I, on the name, but I will certainly find that out for you. Right. And I'm willing to donate a $50 gift certificate from Dix to that young man from the, com uh, from the committee. I don't want, that's just on me. Wow. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. That's great. And uh, Mary. And I, I just have one other little thing that, uh, although he did all of that work and cleaned up and did plantings, he also fundraised for a bench to be put on that location, and it will—it's supposed to be put in this spring. So for and and those are expensive because they are the, the ones that the town uses, uh, the metal ones in all the parks. So, I mean, it's he's he did a lot of work and he's not even done yet. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, he should be recognized, and, and Memorial Day would be a nice day to do that. Um, Mary, before I forget, I did send you a thank you note um, for the the school kids that helped with the newsletter. Um, did you see that? Uh, I sent you a signed thank you letter to send. I did to not them. see that. I know oh. that I I sent you the contact info. I have to. Yep. I'll take was, another look. It okay. was the same day. I, I did it right oh. away because if I don't do things right away, I have a tendency awesome. to. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you probably weren't expecting to see it back again so soon. No, I, uh, I definitely was not. <laughs> okay. okay, folks. Uh, we're down to board member comments. Uh, this has been a long meeting, so I want to give anybody who wants to make any final comments a chance. Yeah, this is Rick. I'd like to make a suggestion that maybe sometime in the future that maybe uh, we meet with John Sands over this history thing and possibly uh, put something in our fall newsletter about how do you feel about kids taking history in high school or word it somehow. I was thinking of an editorial or a letter to the editor type of thing would be. Yeah, that, that would probably work even better, Jennifer, you know, if the, the, the commission was in agreement on it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am so glad you brought that back up, Rick. And I, I think we do need to talk about it. It's um, it's not a crisis issue that is, you know, we need to resolve it at this meeting. Right. But uh, let's make sure, Mary, we put it on our next uh, meeting agenda for the May 12th meeting uh, to discuss so that we have kind of a, a commission consensus on what we might think is appropriate to do uh, before we do anything. Uh, so I, I would request that people not uh, become Lone Rangers and start shooting off, uh, you know, if, the editor. <laughs> if, if you as a private citizen want to contact somebody, that's entirely up to you. Just please don't do it on behalf of the Veterans Commission <laughs> until we have a, a strategy, because uh, I think John has a very valid issue. It's great that he brought it up. He's always been a real friend to veterans, and, and we really love what he does at the high school. So. Uh, let's think of a good way to work with that that will actually have a, an effect. And, and that's why I suggested to him that he think about other groups because I think it'll be much more compelling to the Board of Education uh, if 
a number of community groups come forward and make statements together uh, than just one lone voice in the wilderness. So uh, if, if we decide to do something, so that's something that we need to, we need to sort through and then, you know, figure out a good way forward. And since Laura has been a teacher, she probably has some good insights on how to work with boards of education, right? <laughs> all right. So thank you all for your, your many comments. And thanks again to Chris and Mary for all that you do every single day to support veterans in Weathersfield. So much appreciated and to support this commission. I know we have another meeting starting in like 10 minutes. So uh, unless there are any final closing remarks, we'll say the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much. All right. We'll see Take you on May 3rd. Take care. Bye. Take Bye. care, everyone.